plasma propulsion. When most people think of that term, they think of some futuristic science propelling massive starships into the far reaches of the galaxy. But most people do not realize that plasma propulsion is actually a highly efficient present-day technology that's widely used on many spacecraft, whether interplanetary or if they're satellites just orbiting the Earth. So let's explore this exciting method of propulsion, examine how it's currently used, and take a look at its future. Plasma, the fourth state of matter, is viewed by many as this exotic substance that's very enigmatic and nobody knows much about. However, plasma comprises about 90% of the baryonic matter in the universe, although most of it's up in space. Plasma exists here on Earth as many things that we see and use in our daily lives, such as lightning, CFL and fluorescent lights, fires, and then of course, nuclear stuff. But what is plasma, though? Plasma is, in its most basic sense, an ionized gas. It forms when internal kinetic energy of gas becomes so high it actually rips valence electrons off of the neutral atoms, leaving this free-flowing free soup of ions and electrons floating around. Because this gas is now ionized, it becomes susceptible to electromagnetic forces, which allows it to be manipulated by things such as planetary magnetic fields or confining electric fields. Plasma doesn't like to exist for long periods of time on Earth's surface, though, because the ionized atoms collide quickly with neutral atoms in Earth's atmosphere and re-neutralize. So how is plasma actually used as a means of propulsion in space? In most cases, it's as simple as creating a strong electric field and adding a source of ions. So, like I said before, the basic components of a plasma thruster that you need are a really strong electric field and some source of ions. So here is our gridded ion thruster. It's, it's essentially a basic ion thruster. Um, you have an electron source right here in the nozzle. And next to that are positively charged plates, which are actually, which it's actually a circle. Um, and in between here, you have electrons shooting towards the really positive charged areas. But coming out of these two little holes are xenon atoms, which are moving into the main chamber. And as these neutral xenon atoms are moving in, they're getting bombarded with electrons, which causes them to ionize. So you get all of these nice little positively charged xenon atoms floating around in the middle here. So what happens is that you get enough buildup of these xenon atoms to where you develop this net positive charge inside the ion thruster. And out here you have two grids. One of them is positively charged, and one of them is negatively charged. And what happens is, as the xenon atoms move into this grid, they become accelerated really, really fast. And they get pushed out of the nozzle at about 40 kilometers per second, which is quite a lot. The escape velocity for Earth is only 11.2 kilometers per second. And as they're being pushed out, the positively charged xenon atoms get reintroduced with these um, electrons that are coming out of the cathode, and they re-neutralize, which is pretty cool. And because xenon atoms are moving around in here quite a bit because there's a lot of positive charge, you want to be able to confine them. So there are magnetic fields that are aligned along the edges of the plasma thruster to keep everything confined and moving towards the back. Pretty straightforward. And actually, this um, plasma thruster produces a grand total of 236 meganewtons of thrust. Isn't that crazy? Shit, that's a lowercase m. Okay, 236 millinewtons of thrust. So this isn't gonna get you anywhere fast. What's great about this is that you can keep it on for long periods of time. So you can slowly accelerate yourself to ridiculously fast speeds, which is great for interplanetary travel. It's also great for long-term propulsion. So to maintain a satellite in orbit. Okay, so we learned what happens with a regular gridded ion thruster. What happens if we make it a little bit better? Well, in that case, you get what's called a Hall thruster which actually uses the Hall effect to sort of optimize the amount of xenon that's getting ionized so that it can be propelled out of the back of the, the thruster here. So once again, you have these um, electron guns at the back of the thruster, and then you have xenon atoms being spit out into the little chamber here. But the electrons aren't getting pushed back into a cathode. Essentially, you have these magnets 
that are toroidally produced around the ion thruster that produce a radial magnetic field. And what that does is it generates this E cross B drift that the electrons feel more than the xenon atoms do because the xenon atoms are so heavy. So um, what happens is you have this E cross B field um, where you have uh, E and then you have a magnetic field that's facing radially outward. And what that does is it produces a drift around, axial, an axial drift um, that essentially causes the electrons to move in this confined space and just continue to spiral around the Hall thruster. And what that does is it bombards these xenon atoms as they're moving through to where they become uh, ionized, more so than what you'd see in a gridded ion thruster, way more efficiently. Um, and then they get sped out at ridiculously fast speeds. And so you get a, a little bit larger of a thrust to rate ratio with a Hall thruster than you would a regular gridded ion thruster, which is really cool. And here are some schematics for each of those, just because I can't draw. There's actually a third type of plasma propulsion that hasn't really been put into practice yet, but has been theorized as a viable means of transportation, and that's laser ablation. So essentially, you take a really big high-powered laser and you blast it at some material that breaks apart easily and vaporizes due to exposure to the laser. And that rapidly expanding gas that's coming off of the ablated material um, essentially produces a reactionary force which produces propulsion. And we have seen thrust densities as high as 10,000 newtons per square meter with this type of propulsion. However, that's a little misleading because the actual size of the laser hitting the material is only on the order of like square millimeters or, cute, or centimeters. So the thrust isn't actually that high. It's more on the order of like tens to hundreds of newtons, but still pretty viable. And also you have space lasers. Who can't beat that? So using plasma as a means of propulsion in space is really, really viable. But what about here in the atmosphere? Can you actually use plasma to propel yourself in the atmosphere where gas is awfully thick and the plasma re-neutralizes relatively quickly? The means of producing propulsion in the atmosphere using plasma is through means of what's called an ionic wind thruster. So essentially you generate a really strong electric field between um, a very pointed, very pointed anode and a roundish um, cathode pipe. So uh, very strong positive charge here, um, very strong negative charge here on the order of um, several kilovolts per meter. And essentially what this does is right here, the electric field is so strong, it takes the air molecules that are nearby and it essentially rips electrons off of them. And the electrons go into the nail and then you have all of these ions. And these ions feel this really strong electric field. So they're accelerated towards the negatively charged pipe. But in that process, they run into other neutrals and they re-neutralize themselves. But in that process, they actually transfer momentum to the neutrals. And that causes a net wind or net thrust in the direction of the pipe. So you actually produce a very small amount of airflow within the pipe, um, therefore producing an ionic wind. So to show you how atmospheric ion propulsion actually works, I built this little ion thruster here. Um, I had it 3D printed at the science library. Um, the design isn't mine. Um, I actually found it um, from a gentleman who had previously built an ion thruster similar to this. Essentially, we're using seven copper nails and seven copper pipes as our cathodes and anodes. Um, and you will see here pretty quickly that it actually produces a sizable ionic wind. Um, and you might even be able to see a little bit of corona here, and it will blow this piece of paper. So take note, I don't have any wind blowing in the room besides, you know, my hand. Um, also, I have the power supply set to 8 volts and uh, a max of 10 amps. Um, it only goes to like 2, though. And it runs through this little DC uh, voltage converter here. Uh, which converts it to the order of like kilovolts. This is actually designed for tasers. Um, so I will show you what it looks like when you actually turn it on. So turning it on here, 
you can see and you can hear the hissing um, as plasma is being created at the source here. And it's running through, um, running into neutrals, re-neutralizing, passing that momentum through the plasma thruster and out to the piece of, and out where it hits the piece of paper here. And you can feel it actually produces a, a sizable wind and it smells like ozone, like crazy, because atmospheric chemistry is going on at the same time. So pretty wild stuff. So that's great that you can use 100 kilovolts in order to blow a piece of paper around. But is it, is it actually viable enough to propel like an aircraft in the atmosphere? Actually, it's funny you should ask. There are researchers at MIT right now that are currently using this type of propulsion to propel an ultralight aircraft. Um, so far, it's only able to travel a few hundred yards at most. But with technological advances, we could probably see this as a practical use uh, later on down the road. Speaking of the future, what is the future of plasma propulsion? What does that look like? Well, the future of plasma propulsion is, in short, electromagnetic radiation. So there are two different active research groups right now that are working on increasing the amount of propulsion that you get from one of these ion thrusters. The first one in space is called the Vasimer, which is a essentially a gridded ion thruster, but with the addition of some sort of radio wave emitter. The radio wave emitter emits electromagnetic radiation in the form of radio waves, which energizes the already existing ions within the gridded ion thruster chamber. And this excites them and causes them to leave the back of the ion thruster at a much higher force, producing more thrust. So that's currently the bleeding edge on space propulsion. What about atmospheric propulsion? Funny you should ask. Actually, in this last summer, there was a paper from China that was released showing the use of magnetrons, which are what are used to power your microwave ovens, as sort of a means of creating a plasma afterburner. And it's actually a really cool technology that I can see it will be very viable for producing all electric jet engines in the future. Very exciting stuff. Ion propulsion and plasma propulsion are very viable, efficient means of getting around in space. And while they currently don't possess the power to replace chemical rockets for, say, escaping the Earth's atmosphere or for flying around in an airplane, in the future, we may see this actually happen. It may replace chemical rockets. And who knows, maybe in the far, far future, you might see a fusion-powered plasma propulsion system that can propel a starship into the far reaches of the galaxy. Well, thank you everybody so much for watching. And if you liked the video, please hit that like button down at the bottom. And don't forget to subscribe for more cool videos. And also, if you have any questions, comments, anything you want to add, be sure to leave them in the comments below. And remember, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.